Okay, open your Bibles up to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. It has been since Easter when I said that last. Uh, We stopped at the resurrection in this book, but it was the middle of the book. So who was raised in the middle of the Gospel of John, church? Lazarus was. That's what we kind of ended on Easter and and talked about, the resurrection of Lazarus. Jesus raised him from the dead. And and so now, um, as we looked at the first half of the Gospel of John, uh, we're going to kind of look at the second half. The first half, just to kind of get us up to speed, to get us to kind of know what's going on, we're kind of jumping in the middle of, the, of a book here. Jesus had just performed seven miracles. And really, those first 11 chapters of John is Jesus, is John showing us these miracles that Jesus did, showing us his power, showing us his wisdom, giving clarity that he truly was the Messiah. Uh, We said that really the theme verse or the purpose of this book is found in John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So this is the purpose. John said, listen, I'm writing this book to you because I want to show you, I want you to see for yourself as you read these stories that Jesus Christ truly is the Son of God. And so all the book is showing us who he is. We've seen miracles. We we saw how he conquered sickness and storms and suffering and death, that none of those have power over him. And and, and now we come to chapter 12. And and this is really where the book starts to turn. And we almost see it it take a a whole uh, whole nother turn in what is taking place and what has happened. The rest of John takes place in one week. So the first half was the three years of Jesus' ministry. The second half of this book takes place in one week. John writes about this last week of Jesus more than any other author does, Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Because everything is coming to a point here. The private ministry of Jesus is no more. Everyone knew what Jesus was, who Jesus was. Everybody knew that he was the guy that raised Lazarus from the dead. The private ministry was gone. If this was today, he would be viral on YouTube, he would be on ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox. I mean, everyone would know him. And even in that day without social media, all Israel knew who Jesus was. Now, like anyone, and even today, everyone has an opinion about him. And we're gonna see that here. You have a group of people that believed and worshiped Jesus. You have a group of people that followed Jesus for his signs. And you have a group of people that wanted to kill him because they were met, because Jesus was messing up the religious system that they had in place. Do you get the scene here, church? I mean, this is what is taking place. Uh, the Pharisees, they were looking for a way to kill Jesus. Chapter 11, we saw that. And then to add to all this, it's Passover week. So all these emotions, everything's taking place, and now we find ourselves in Jerusalem, and it's Passover week. Jerusalem, usually they say, had about 50,000 people that are resident there, but during Passover week, you had over 100,000 people that were there. So everybody came to this area, to Jerusalem. Everything's coming to the head. I mean, this is the climax of it all. If you've ever been in a movie, and in the middle of the movie, it's get into that place. This is the place where you don't want to have to get up and go use the restroom in the middle of the movie. I hate, these movies nowadays are like three hours long, and then they give you this big thing to drink, and you walk in, and then you always have to use the restroom right at the climax. Listen, this is the part, you don't want to have to do that. Everything's coming to this, and, and you have the emotions of the crowd, you have the religious leaders and what they're walking and trying to kill, look, Jesus, finding that way that they can kill him. All this is taking place. We come to chapter 12. So let's read our text together, and, and let's dive into God's word this morning, and, and we're going to read verses 1 through 19 as we see what is taking place in this last week. You with me, church? Here we go. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, so they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at, with, with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment and made, made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. 
The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because an amount, an amount of him, excuse me, because an account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see they are gaining, that they are gain, you see that you are gaining nothing, look, the world has gone after him. This is God's word for us to obey today. I, I want you to see through groups of people here, the first I want you to see is the unashamed worship of a follower. The unashamed worship of a follower. And, and that's what it starts here in chapter 12. It, it's six days before Passover. Jesus was in Bethany. This is about two miles outside of Jerusalem. So not really far, but he wasn't downtown. He wasn't in the main parts of Jerusalem, uh, just to uh, the east a little bit. And so there he was in Bethany. According to Matthew and Mark, he was at the house of Simon the leper. We don't know that much about Simon the leper. Actually, we don't know anything about him except his name is in Matthew and Mark. Uh, we would believe that Jesus probably healed this man from lepr of leprosy. And so here we see Jesus is there, probably Simon since it's his house. We also see that Lazarus is there, Martha is there, and Mary's there. And then the disciples, we also know, are there. In verse 2, we see here that Martha is serving. Now stop just for a second and think about that. If you've ever read the Gospel of Luke, and if you remember in the Gospel of Luke, we also see Martha serving at one point. It says that Martha's serving there, and Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet, and Martha gets kind of upset that Mary's just sitting at Jesus' feet and not helping in the kitchen, and so Martha comes to Jesus and says, will you tell Mary to do something? And, and Jesus says, Martha, Mary has chosen what is best. Now, it's interesting. You say, Jeremiah, is this the same thing? Has Martha not learned her lesson? And, and I, I think this is a different situation here. Because in the Gospel of Luke, it says this, that Martha was distracted by serving. And I think that's important because here it just said that Martha served. I think it comes down to motive. Listen, serving's not wrong. It's just where your motive is at. And I would like to think that Martha by this time has grown. And yes, even though she is serving, her motive is different. But this story really is not about Martha. We just see a couple words about Martha. It's really about Mary. This story is about Mary. Now, this is not Mary Magdalene. This is not Mary of Jesus' mother. This is Mary, whose brother was Lazarus, who was raised from the dead. Mary here does this incredible act of worship. Look at verse 3. It says, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard. Now, what is nard? Turn to the person next to you and tell them what nard is, because I know you know, but the person next to you probably doesn't. So go ahead and tell them what it is, right? Okay? Because everybody knows what that is, right? I, I had to look it up too. Okay? It, 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 Nard comes from a flower in India, and it's an expensive um, ointment. And so here we see what was put on his feet was worth 300 denarii. And so that's a, a year's wages for somebody who is working in the field. And so that's a lot. Now, that's a lot of money. 
that here she breaks this open and pours it on Jesus' feet. She bends down and as she goes to wash his feet. Now again, think about that time frame. Again, when you read these stories, you've got to jump into the story a little bit. And here are all these people reclining at the table. They didn't sit in chairs like we did. They would more lay down. And, and so Mary comes up to Jesus and starts to wash his feet. Now, the feet were gross at that time. They didn't have roads like we do. They didn't come in cars. They walked on dirt roads. They wore sandals. And so here Jesus comes and, or here Mary, or Mary comes and takes the dirty feet of Jesus and washes them. It's an act of humility. It was an act of outward worship to him. She goes even farther. I mean, that alone is, is humbling. That alone is showing a sign of humility. But she goes even farther, and she lets down her hair. And instead of getting a towel and washing or drying them off with the towel, no, she dries them off with her hair. Listen, the hair is important to a Jewish lady. My understanding, just reading some uh, Jewish literature this week, if an unmarried woman would not always have her hair covered, but it is always fastened in the back. But a married woman would have it covered. And her hair really was only shown to her husband. Now, we don't know if Mary was married or if not, but e either way, we know what she did here was not norm, was not what everybody would have expected. And see, Mary was showing her devotion and worship to Jesus. Judas didn't like that very much. Judas here looks at it and is like, what in the world? Why is she doing this? Now, he makes the excuse, man, this money could be given to the poor. Now, as we see here, Judas could care less about the poor. He was a thief, and he just wanted the money. Jesus puts him in his place, verse 7, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you would not always have me. Listen, it's interesting that do you remember when Jesus went to the tomb? Uh, actually, when he went off the cross and they put him in the tomb, they didn't really have time to put spices and they didn't have time to burial, bury him like they were supposed to. That's why the ladies were coming to the, the tomb those days later to do that. He was kind of taken off the cross and put in there. Well, here Jesus is saying, she's preparing me for my burial. He, she's doing something as she's putting this expensive spice, this expensive ointment on Jesus. You know, I was reading, and a lot of commentators believe that Mary knew something, that she picked something up that the other disciples never did. You see, Jesus had said numerous times that he was going to die. That this wasn't something that was just like he never said. They just never caught on. But maybe Mary understood something that the other 12 disciples who were all men did not understand. And all the ladies say, that's right. <laughs> but she understood something here that Jesus even connects with the burial that maybe she didn't know it all, but here she comes and anoints his feet. Now I'll give the application question that's on your bolts in a second, but let's continue and look at the next crowd that we see here. It's the jealous plot of the religious. They did not like what Jesus was doing. They did not like what they were hearing. They did not like what they were seeing. Crowds were getting larger for Jesus. Crowds were getting bigger. More followers were coming. And so just to keep this short, they wanted to kill Jesus. They wanted to kill Lazarus. Why? The religious leaders did not want their religion to be shaken. They had a picture of what religion should look like, and they did not want that to change. And anyone who got in the way deserved to die. Listen, I've been in a lot of churches, even had people come here and go, that thought religion or a church system should look a certain way, and if it was not going to change, they didn't want to be part of that. Listen, the main focus was not the gospel. You see, the Pharisees missed the gospel. They missed the good news about who Jesus was. They did not want to change their quote-unquote religious system. They saw too many people believing in Jesus. I mean, look at verse 11. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. And they said, no, enough is enough. we got to end this. 
And then it kind of comes to this climax here as this next chapter is the triumphal entry or we celebrate on Palm Sunday. But even in this, because here's the third group that I want you to see, is the empty praise of the crowd. Look at verse 18 again. It says, the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. Here's this crowd, they see him, that he's doing these signs, and and so they're like, man, let's come. You see, the crowd did not understand who Jesus was. The crowd, here Jesus comes riding on a donkey, and they totally even missed that. The significance of him riding on the donkey was a sign of peace. You see, if you were ridden on a horse, that's a sign of war or of battle. They wanted Jesus to come and to be king right then. They wanted Jesus to to deliver them from the Roman government. And so they're like, yes, I mean, he's raising people from the grave. He's healing leopards. He's doing all these things. This is our king. This truly is the Messiah. If you remember back in chapter 6, they were trying to forcefully take Jesus and put him as king. Jesus slipped away because they were right there, it says, about to take him and saying, yes, you're king now. Because, yes, we don't want to have to deal with all the Romans anymore. Come and deliver us from this. It says here they laid palm branches down. Palm branches were a sign of Jewish nationalism. It wasn't just to make the road look pretty. It wasn't just so there were puddles and I didn't want the donkey to have to step in the puddles. No, palm branches were important to them. It was saying that, yes, Jewish freedom, we need this now, and Jesus is the one that's going to do this. And so that's why they cried out, as it said there also, Hosanna. What's Hosanna mean? It means save us now. Hosanna, save us now. And then they even say, King of Israel. Their praise came to Jesus because they thought he was going to deliver them, that the rescuer had come this day. They wanted something out of Jesus right then. They wanted their best life now. However, when Jesus did not do that, their praise quickly turned, and they quickly walked away as they cried, crucify him, crucify him. He didn't save them, and so they wanted to get rid of him. If he wasn't going to do what we thought, just a couple days later, they hung him on a tree and walked away from him. Now, what do you do with this text? What what, what do you do? We can let this passage fill our minds, or we can let it run into our hearts. So let's look at this text. Let me give you some things to think about and ask yourself. Here's the first thing. Will, Will my worship of him be unashamed? Okay, let's not just listen to some stories here. Let's just not feel the stories. Let's take it to the heart, because I think that's what the word of God does, right? In Hebrews, it says it pierces the heart. And so the reason why we go through these is we talk about them, but let it come to our heart now. And so let me ask you, we can look at Mary and go, yes, man, Mary had this unashamed worship of who Jesus was. And so let me ask you, will your worship be unashamed? We love the example of Mary, but will you follow in that example? One of the practices of our church is is worship. As I look at Mary's worship here, I see it's public. It's sacrificial. It's personal. It's public. It's for all to see that her worship is to Jesus. Listen, there's nothing wrong with private worship, but we also see all through the scriptures of public worship. Because the public worship, sometimes we're like, well, I'm just a shy person, so I'll kind of do it in my closet. Great, we all should be doing it in our closet. That's where it starts. But there is also a worship that we need to have that is public, that we're letting others, we're letting our kids, we're letting our spouse, we're letting the people around us say, yes, Jesus is the most important thing to me. Christ is enough for me. It doesn't matter what's going on, Christ is enough. Listen, is your worship to him unashamed? Public, it's sacrificial. I mean, here, that ointment, maybe that was a, a family heirloom that got passed down to her from generation to generation. I, I, maybe she had been saving that for years. There wasn't something that just kind of happened real quick. She, we don't think she was that wealthy. So here, she sacrificially says, Jesus, here's my worship to you. And then it was personal. Her getting on her knees and washing the dirty feet of her Savior. Taking her hair down and then wash, drying it with her hair. Listen, it was personal. 
Listen, can I ask you, how would you describe your worship of Jesus? How would you describe your worship of Jesus? If I would ask you to put three words down of your worship to Jesus, how would you describe it right now? I'm not asking how would you describe it a year ago when you were on fire for him. I'm asking how would you describe your worship of Jesus right now? Would it be public, sacrificial, personal? Or would it be non-existent, short, leftovers? How would you describe your worship of Jesus? Is it unashamed? Are you willing to let others see your worship of Jesus? Listen, how about at your workplace? Are you unashamed of your worship of Jesus? How about at your school? Are you unashamed of your worship of Jesus? Uh, how about in your neighborhood? Are you unashamed of your worship of Jesus? Now, you might have to answer this second question before you really can even get to that one. And so here's the second one. Well, I allow the gospel to disrupt my life. You see, the Pharisees wanted nothing to do with the good news that Jesus brought. Listen, are you trying to fit the gospel message and story into your life? Or are you letting the gospel take over your life? There is a difference. Jeremiah, how, how, do you, how do you do that? How do you let the gospel take over your life? Well, first it starts with the surrender to the gospel. Listen, salvation is not by working, <coughs> excuse me, salvation is not by working for your faith. It's not by adding Jesus to your life. That's not what the gospel is. The gospel message will disrupt your life. Why? Because it's a takeover. It's Jesus becoming your life. That's what Colossians chapter 3, verse 4 says. Listen, when did that happen to you? When did that happen where the gospel took over your life? Not just where you kind of added him, now we just kind of do a couple things, but know that he is your life, it says in Colossians. You see, the gospel does disrupt our life. Please don't leave here today unless you know for sure that he is your Lord and Savior. But let me ask you, for those who are saved, listen, we have, we have to see life through the lens of the gospel, even if it disrupts what the world says life should look like. You hear me? Even if the world says this is how it should be. No, listen, when we live the gospel out practically in our life, it is going to change things. It is going to make things look a little bit different. I'll, I'll practically give you some ways. When we live in the gospel story, sin looks differently. When we live in the gospel story, sin's going to look differently. I, I see sin not as this pleasure that the world sees it, but I see it as disobedience to my Savior. You see, when I live in the gospel story, it, it, sin looks differently. When I live in the gospel story, death looks differently. Listen, I, I don't fear death. Because I know it's not the end. I sorrow over death when loved ones die in this world. But that's not the end. I said, Jeremiah, how? You see, the gospel disrupts my selfishness and tells me that there's more. You see, when I live in the gospel story, even death looks different. When I live in the gospel story, Purpose is defined. Purpose is defined. I know what my life is supposed to do. It's supposed to bring him glory, whether eat or drink, whatsoever I do, do all to the glory of God. When I live in the gospel story, listen, Jesus is my all. Church, let me ask you, will we live daily in a religious system trying to do good and do what's right, or will we live daily in the gospel story letting it disrupt every area of our life, but that we brings us that peace and that joy and that hope that only the gospel can give us? How will you live? What will your life look like? I'm not saying church is not important. That's why I keep calling it a religious system. You see, when we live in the gospel story, we see how important his body is the church. When we live in the gospel story, we will worship him, and our praise will be so much more than just what the crowd did. 
And so that's the last question is, will my praise be more than circumstantial? Listen, no matter what's going on in your life, when I understand and live in the gospel story, my praise to Jesus continues no matter what goes on in my life. It would be a praise based on what Jesus did on the cross. Listen, church, the gospel, it changes everything about the way I live. It's not just in the good times. It's not just in the bad times. In everything that I do, when I understand what Jesus did for me on the cross, when I understand how he went to a grave and rose from that grave, now that he's sitting in the heavens, and I understand that he is coming back on a horse one day in Revelation chapter 19. When I understand that, it changes the outlook of my whole life. It changes how I live. It changes as I go through my life. What happens and what takes place? You see, the gospel, it changes my life. So how will you let the gospel change your life this week? It might disrupt. When I say disrupt, I know we're looking at that as a negative word. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's a good thing that the gospel disrupts our life. Because you know what? We get so stuck in this world system that we need it to shake us out a little. Will you let the gospel really take over your life? No matter what the circumstances are, to say, God, I'm going to praise you as I look to what you have already done in the story of the good news of Jesus. As Isaac comes and we are ready to close, or Miguel, I, this is a book that my kids, uh, I picked up my kids' library or something, they are raised by William Carey. It's the story of, uh, of William Carey. Uh, let me just, you know, let's just say today, though, I could give you a book of your life. And, and it was past, present, and future. I could hand you a book, and it was all your life. How, how many of you would like to read that book? <laughs> See, Jeremiah, if I could do that, life would be a lot easier. If I could just look ahead and see and read that book, man, life would be so much easier. Maybe. Might not want to read what's ahead of us. But church, hear me. The gospel does not give me my own book. It it puts me in his book. The the gospel is not about my life. The gospel is about me being part of his story. You see, we're trying to create our own life. We're trying to, this is me, and I'm saying, listen, it's not your life. It is. I want to be part of his story. You see, when I realize that I am part of his story, I already know what the future is. We say, man, if I knew the future, then man, I, I already know what the future is. Yeah, there's some blurry parts that I might not know yet, but I know what all eternity is. I know what happens when he comes back because I'm part of his story. I'm not gonna tell you to go out and write your own story, no. I wanna tell you to be part of his story. Because when we understand his story, that's the good news. Listen, it changes everything about how we live. It changes everything about our life. It changes why we get up in the morning. It changes why we go to work. It changes even when we have sickness and death that takes place in our life, we realize that I'm part of his story. This isn't my story. I'm part of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords story. And so I'm gonna look to him because I do know what the end is. It it, it changes how we relate to our kids. It changes what's important to us. That we get to be part of his story. Listen, that is awesome. I hope you won't get stuck trying to write your own story. Because there is a bigger story that we get to be part of. And when we get this, when we understand his story, man, it gives us that peace. It gives us a joy. It gives us an excitement to want to live. I'll tell you, my story about my life isn't going to be too exciting. But if you take my story and you stick it in his story, 
and you wrap it around his story. Listen, God wants to use you. He wants to use you to communicate his story, the gospel, the good news. Listen, we know what it is. Will you live it out? Don't live for this world. Let the gospel change you this week. So practically, this week, how are you going to let the gospel change your life? What do you need to change? What actions are that you had last week? Do you like, no, that was not living in the gospel story. What took place last week in your worship? Was it to him or was it to something else? It was not in the gospel story. Will you let the gospel change you this week? Will we bow our head and close your eyes? With heads bowed and eyes closed. Listen, will you go to God right now? And ask, what changes need to take place in your life right now? in order for you to truly live in the gospel story. What place of surrender do you need to be at? Let's not be like the crowd that just comes on one day and praises him. Listen, if we do that on Sunday, then go out and live how we want, then we're just like the crowd here. One day praising him, and the next day saying crucify him. Listen, let our praise be like Mary. Unashamed worship. Continue. It wasn't just a one time for Mary. No, you see Mary through the gospel, through this last week of Jesus' life. You see Mary going to the tomb. Why? Because her praise was continual. She was there at the foot of the cross. An unashamed worship. Don't just come in Sunday and sing about how great he is, but then go out and live how your life is. Let's be part of his story this week. So will you put your burdens, put your cares, put all that, surrender to him again at the foot of the cross. And if you're here today and you do not know Christ as your Lord and Savior, listen, please don't leave till you come and talk to me. Talk to somebody. Let us share with you how you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's stand together as we pray. Father, I come before you right now, and God, I acknowledge that you are good. God, I acknowledge that you are faithful, that you are just. And God, I I pray for every person that is here, Lord. You know what they're walking through. You know what they're going through. And so, God, I pray this text would not just be some text that they hear and this kind of it sticks in their mind, but, God, I pray you would allow it to s- circle over them, help them to go to their hearts. God, yes, I, I hope there's no one that would be in the category of the Pharisees today, but there might be. Someone here is just very hostile towards you right now and really wants nothing to do with you. God, I pray that you'd show them the hope of the gospel. God, I, I pray for those that are here where probably it's easy for us to get into that crowd situation where our praise to him is good as long as life is good. As long as life is good, we'll praise you. But God, I pray that we'd see more what the good news is. It's not just about living 70 years on this life good or 80 years on this life good. No, it's so much more. God, I pray that we would all have a worship like Mary did an unashamed worship to you. God, that it would be public and it would be sacrificial and it would be personal. So God, let us go out this week and truly live the gospel story. Let it disrupt every area that needs to. And God, will you let us be a people that truly do make a difference in the world that we live in. Let us be that light, that salt. For your glory, God, for your honor, for your praise. And we can pray all these things because of the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen.
Church, I want to, this week, as we head out into this week, um, is what we call our week of prayer. Another thing that we kind of mentioned last week. I, I hope that you will join us in this. Yes, yeah, starting Tuesday morning, you'll get a video. And, and so just a little video that I did, they're like under eight minutes, I think. And, and just of a, a challenge on prayer, excuse me, as we go into the day. And, and maybe you don't listen to it at lunch, or maybe you don't listen to it at night, but sometime we stop and watch that. And, and then will you fast one meal this week? But listen, I told you the vision that God's doing our church, what he's given to us. We have to go to him. If we don't pray, this isn't going to work. Our dependence is totally on God. And so I want to encourage you, will you take just one meal this week and just fast with us? And if you want to do a whole day, great. But will you do at least a meal and just stop and pray? Maybe go outside or get away and just take that 30 minutes that you normally would eat and just pray. And, and then starting Tuesday morning, um, we'll have prayer meetings here, just times of prayer together. At 6.30 till 7.15, if you have to leave at 7, that's fine. Come when you can, leave when you have to. But I hope that you'll join me. I'll be here every morning, third Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Did it last year and just had a great time just praying together. No one's going to force you to pray out loud. But yes, I hope some will. You come, look forward to praying together. I hope you'll come and join us. And then this Wednesday is Fresh Encounter. And I'd love to see everyone back to come and to pray. We have child care. Will you come as we take communion together, as we worship, as we pray together? We're going to spend some specific time praying just for uh, children that have walked away from the faith. I, I want to take some specific time and pray for those children. Pray for those that, that are not walking with Jesus or that are lost. And, and so we want to really cry out to God for that at that time. So I hope that you will come to Fresh Encounter. We moved the time up to 6.30. We used to do it at 7, so know that it's at 6.30. It, it's done by 7.30, 7.40, so that you can get home, get your kids in bed by 8. Say, man, my kids go to bed a little early, maybe for this one night. I, I hope that you'll come and, and join us as we go to God and, and we pray. We have to do it. The vision is big, but we have a big God, so we have to continue to rest on Him. And so I hope that you'll be excited what God's up to and, and that you will continue to praise Him as you live out on mission this week. Amen, church? Amen. God bless you and hope you have a great afternoon. You are loved.